Hey, BC here for BC Nephro. I'm Dr. Brian Cronin, board certified nephrologist and clinical specialist in hypertension. Today's topic is going to be an overview of diuretics. So the kidney filters a lot of sodium. It turns out if you have normal kidney function, the kidney filters something like 25 million milliequivalents of sodium a day. The majority of the sodium that the glomeruli filters is reabsorbed in the tubules. So that in the person with normal kidney function and a normal diet, less than 1% of the sodium that was filtered ends up excreted in the urine. Diuretics can impair the sodium reabsorption in different parts of the tubule. And today we're gonna to go through the tubule and explain how different diuretics work. Understanding this will lead to insights on their clinical uses as well as side effects. I will link an article in the description below at bcnephro.com, which will show illustrations of the different cells and sites of action of the diuretics. So first, the proximal convoluted tubule. This is where 65% of the filtered sodium is reabsorbed, and the diuretics that work in this section are carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. The main being acetazolamide. There are other medications used for neurologic indications, specifically topiramate and zonisamide, which have a carbonic anhydrase effect to a lesser degree of acetazolamide. Since the majority of the filtered sodium is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, one would think that blocking this process would lead to a significant diuresis. However, this is not the case because the majority of the sodium that is blocked by these medications in the proximal tubule ends up being reabsorbed more distally, particularly in the loop of Henle. So in the proximal tubule, sodium is reabsorbed mainly by a sodium hydrogen ion antiporter. This process also leads to the reabsorption of bicarbonate in the proximal tubule. Turns out that this process is dependent on carbonic anhydrase, so blocking the carbonic anhydrase will impair the sodium as well as bicarbonate reabsorption here. Although much of the sodium ends up being reabsorbed in the loop of Henle, the bicarbonate is not. This comes out in the urine and it also induces renal potassium losses. The main indications for this medication are the treatment of metabolic alkalosis, which is not chloride responsive. These are typically associated with hypertension and or volume overload. It also can be used in emergent glaucoma cases and as a treatment for altitude sickness. Acetazolamide has been used as an add-on to loop diuretics in the treatment of acute decompensated conditions of heart failure. The adverse effects of acetazolamide are that it can induce a metabolic acidosis as well as cause hypokalemia. They are also associated with nephrolithiasis kidney stones, particularly calcium phosphate stones. This is likely due to an effect in the distal tubule as opposed to the proximal tubule, but can be seen with these medications. Moving on to the loop of Henle, this is where about 25% of the sodium is reabsorbed and loop diuretics, specifically furosemide, bumetanide, torsamide, and etherokinic acid have their effective action. They block this sodium potassium chloride transporter. These result in the most effective diuresis. Blocking this transporter also leads to potassium losses and increased urinary calcium excretion. The impairment of sodium reabsorption in the loop impairs urinary dilution, so one may think that it would cause hyponatremia, but it also the sodium that's reabsorbed in the loop in the medullary part of the loop of Henle contributes to the interstitial gradient, so it also impairs urinary concentration. So for these reasons, the loop diuretics are used for volume overloaded edematous states. They can be used for hypertension, although they're less effective than the thiazide diuretics that we'll talk about later. They can be used along with saline for the treatment of hypercalceria and they can be used for treatment of hyponatremia, either hypervolemic hyponatremia or euvolemic hyponatremia, as in SIDH. Furosemide is the most commonly used. However, this has a relatively short half-life and the GI absorption can be inconsistent. Bumetanide and torsamide have longer half-lives and more predictable GI absorption. For this reason, these medications, specifically torsamide, may be more effective in treatment of congestive heart failure that might not be responsive 
to furosemide. Those three drugs I, I mentioned also contain a sulfa moiety, although the majority of patients who have sulfa allergies to antibiotics don't cross-react to the sulfa and diuretics. Some do. And the fourth, ethocrinic acid, doesn't contain sulfa and would be the loop diuretic that would be required in people with a true diuretic sulfa allergy. Another adverse effect of these medications is phototoxicity uh, to very high doses. Moving on to the distal convoluted tubule where about 5% of the sodium is reabsorbed. We have thiazide diuretics. These include hydrochlorothiazide, chlorthalidone, indapamide, and metolazone. There also is an IV formulation. These block the sodium chloride co-transporter. Because there's a lesser degree of sodium reabsorbed here, it is not as effective for volume overloaded states, but it is quite effective for hypertension. This process also affects calcium reabsorption so that these medications are an effective treatment for hypercalcemia. These medications can also be used as an add-on to loop diuretics in congestive heart failure. The side effects are gonna be hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis, also hypercalcemia. These medications can also cause hyponatremia. Like loop diuretics, blocking the sodium reabsorption impairs urinary dilution, but because these are in the cortical part of the kidney and not the medullary, they do not contribute to the interstitial gradient. So they do not affect urine concentration and therefore are more associated with hyponatremia. Moving on to the aldosterone sensitive distal nephron in the connecting segment and collecting tubule, you have potassium sparing diuretics. There are two types of potassium sparing diuretics. The first type blocks the epithelial sodium transporter the main indication for these is hypokalemia, although amiloride in higher doses can be used for refractory hypertension. In addition, amiloride can be used to prevent nephrotoxicity from lithium as lithium enters the tubule cells through the same sodium transporter. The side effects are gonna be hyperkalemia, and for triamterene, it can also cause crystals and drug-induced stones. Also in the aldosterone-sensitive distal nephron, mineral corticoid antagonists work by blocking the aldosterone receptor. These include spironolactone, aplerinone, and venerinone. The aldosterone receptor typically leads to upregulation of the sodium channel that is blocked by the other potassium sparing diuretics. So blocking this leads to, impairs this upregulation. These medications are used for primary hyperaldosteronism in addition to hypokalemia refractory hypertension, heart failure, and proteinuric kidney diseases. In addition to causing hyperkalemia, spironolactone has effects on the progesterone receptor and can cause gynecomastia. I find this to be rare at the 25 milligram dose, but can happen at higher doses. Aplerinone doesn't have this effect. It's more specific to the aldosterone receptor, but it is less potent than spironolactone. Phenerinone is a non-steroidal mineral corticoid antagonist and supposedly has less effects on raising potassium and lowering blood pressure, but it can decrease proteinuria in diabetic kidney disease. So that's it. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, you might as well hit like and subscribe, leave a comment, share this video with someone who you think might be interested in learning about the diuretics. And until next time.